Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Sandy. And this is the Italian American Stories Podcast. So today on the podcast, we're going to try something new. Throughout all the researching and trying to find stories, I end up collecting articles (laughs) upon articles. (laughs) And she means upon articles, several binders, several totes filled with it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like right now, mom and I are looking in the podcast room and there's like those three inch binders, probably have four or five of them that are just filled with articles. And some of them are, you know, full stories that I plan on turning into an episode, but probably two of them are just Articles that while I was researching, I found another article about an Italian American and I'm like, well, I'll print that and I'll check it later. So what I've been doing this last week or two is going through all of these articles and seeing kind of what their potential is. Do they have, can I turn them into an episode or are they just kind of, there's just not a whole lot there. Like it's maybe just the article or just a little bit of research. And um, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to start a new segment of the podcast called Tells of the Archive. And basically what we're going to do is we're just going to have these articles that we're going to read. And maybe if I found a little bit of information on it, I'll talk about it. But that's what we'll do. So Tells of the Archive will basically be mini stories within an episode. Yeah, I think it'll be fun. Yeah. And then that way these articles aren't going to waste because... I hundreds hate, of them. Hundreds of them. <laughs> I know. And I hate to get rid of them um, just because I can't turn them into a full episode. So like I said, there's a couple of these where I have, I was able to find a little bit of information, but just not enough to turn into a full episode. So let's go ahead and dive into our first Tells of the Archives episode. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Um, so we're first going to start with the tell of the tragic sinking of a tugboat called the Dory Emery. On the evening of December 3rd, 1885, the Dory Emery was towing a stone barge on the East River in the New York area. And as the towboat was going up the river, it all of a sudden blew up when the boiler on the boat exploded. And so this explosion, it was so big that the windows of the nearby business and homes were shattered. And the shore of the river, I guess, was just littered with debris from the tugboat. And wow, really that was a major explosion. Huge explosion. I mean, could you imagine... The, just seeing that destruction that would be oh, no, terrifying. Yeah. Um, and I guess eyewitnesses said after the explosion, they saw, quote, a column of smoke and steam go up in the air about 700 or 800 feet. So, wow. I know. Do you think that was maybe the boiler? Like, yeah. Yeah, <sighs> that's what I would guess. That's terrifying. Yeah, because it was steam. It was steam, exactly. And so that must have maybe just, who knows, it was probably everything. But, and I guess apparently the explosion was heard over two miles away. So luckily nobody on shore was hurt, but sadly the five men aboard the Dory Emery, they were all killed in the explosion. And a nearby boat, uh, they heard and saw the explosion. And immediately after the explosion, they sent out some men in, you know, kind of like one of their small, mm-hmm. smaller lifeboats or whatever to go look for survivors. And one of the men on the little boat said that there was no sign of life. Yeah, sadly to say, but that makes sense. That, it does. That capacity of a explosion. Of- oh, yeah. I mean, if there's debris on the shore and the right. windows are exploding, mm-hmm. yeah, it's that's really sad. Um, and so they, you know, kind of sent out rescuers and it, it, two days later it was reported that they were still not able to recover the bodies. And they kind of just thought at this point that they had been carried out to sea. So, cause they weren't finding anything. So one of the five men that were on the boat, uh, who was killed, his name was Angelo Lewis Caffarata, and he was actually the engineer of the tugboat. And Angelo's brother-in-law, John Arata, was also on the boat and killed. And Angelo and John, they were both part owners of the Dory Emery. I don't think that they were the two only owners, but I think they had a part in it. So I think the captain um, was the other owner. And Angelo, he lived in Hoboken, New Jersey, and he had a wife and a young child, an infant, actually, is what I probably should have said. So yeah. And John, he was married to Angelo's sister, and they also had a child together. And so the authorities, when they first contacted Angelo's wife and told her that he was expected to be deceased, I guess she apparently just collapsed in grief and was just upset. I mean, and it's not only the shock of having your husband, somebody telling you your husband's passed away, but in that manner, 
you know. Right. Yeah, that's those were probably really tough jobs anyway. Exactly. You're probably gone a lot anyway. Yeah, so. and then well, and then the thought of not recovering the body, you know, to where right. you can lay him to rest. Right. So Angelo's mother, she was extremely distraught though. Um, and actually this is how I first found out about this horrible story is because I read an article about her and that's kind of how I started researching this. And so her name was Pauline and she was 56 years old when Angelo was killed on December 3rd. And sadly, the searching for the bodies and the cleanup continued on for a few days and they could not find the bodies. And I think on December 12th, everything kind of hit Pauline and she... The mom. The mom, yeah. And uh, so she was found by a police officer standing at the edge of a dock and she was staring into the East River. And remember, the Uh East River is where they were. Her. And this officer, Alderetta, he was kind of just watching her. So he watches her walk up to the deck and she's staring into the water. And then he said he starts seeing her lean over the dock Mm-mm. and she's like scanning the river, you know, sort of moving her head and looking around into the river. And the officer, one thing that he said that really shocked him was that she was not shivering in the cold. And this is December in New York. Right. She's by the water and she wasn't dressed appropriately. And he knew something was wrong when she started sobbing loudly and yelled out in Italian, you are waiting for me, my Angelo. You call me, I will come, my boy. And this officer was Italian, so he he understood. And so then she raised something to her lips and repeatedly kissed it. At this point, the officer, he he knew, okay, she's ready to do something drastic. And so he runs up to her and he grabs her by the arms and he pulls her away from the dock. And she was screaming for him to let her go so that she could go join her son, Angelo. Oh. I know. It's... Understanding, but Yeah, sad. so sad. And again, I think it's always tragic when you just lose somebody, but in this manner and then not having the body to lay him to right. rest and grieve over. And, and so her daughter, who... So Pauline's daughter, who was also John's wife, who was killed in the accident, he she came to the police station to get Pauline, and um, she told the officer that she will keep a closer eye on her from now on. Yeah, because... She might try again. Exactly. Yeah. And so when, you know, she got to the police station, they found what she was kissing and she was kissing a photograph of Angelo. Oh, I know. And so after this, this article was dated December 12th, 1885. I couldn't find anything on this family. Nothing on Ancestry, nothing in the newspaper databases. But I felt like this is this is a great example of Tales of the Archives, kind of what we want to do, because just ends abruptly it just ends <laughs> abruptly but it's still i feel like a story that um you know shows like the love of an italian american family uh you know we just got done with mother's day talking about the love of a mother and her son and you know i think it's just a story that that should be told but i couldn't find anything after this so i hope that this family found some peace and were able to well, move forward in their lives well i think that's kind of a good sign that they did because True. you would have found if pauline had um, taken her own life. Exactly. So maybe she found her own way to grieve and they moved on. And they moved on and found some peace and yeah, just lived their own life. So that's a good point. No news is good news sometimes. So, (laughs) but there is our first story of Tales of the Archives. And our next story is about love. (laughs) (laughs) And so I found this article and it's from the Patriot News out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it's dated May 26, 1886. This headline reads, An only daughter, Rose Hopkins, elopes with an Italian worker who tells the young lady that his father is a count and that he came to America because of trouble. (laughs) So, Uh it's a love story with some drama here. (laughs) (laughs) There's not a whole lot here, but I, I am going to read the article because it's pretty fascinating. So, a great sensation was created at Audenried, a town eight miles south of this city. Yesterday, by the announcement that Miss Rose Hopkins, the highly accomplished daughter of Richard Hopkins, the general superintendent of the Auden Reed Coal Company, had eloped with a common Italian railroad worker. (laughs) (laughs) The new railroad ran close by the Hopkins residence, and the young Italian often entered the yard for the purpose of getting drinking water. It was during these errands that he became acquainted with Miss Hopkins, who, being a master of the Italian and Spanish languages, held frequent and long conversations with the son of Italy. The daughter told her father that the young Italian was a man of more than ordinary talents and that the railroad was no place for him. He not only could speak Italian, but French and Spanish also. 
He said he was the son of a count, but was compelled to leave his native land for political reasons. When he came to this country, he thought he would have no difficulty in obtaining some easy employment. But in this, he was disappointed and he had to take up hard work or starve. He therefore accepted work on the railroad. Miss Hopkins' parents never suspected for a moment that their only daughter thought of making a lover out of a strange Italian. (laughs) (laughs) The elopement was first discovered on Sunday morning when a servant went upstairs to call Miss Hopkins for breakfast. Uh Uh-oh. So she's a pretty fancy lady. I mean, a servant's coming to get her for breakfast. (laughs) Oh, that's why that they didn't want her to be with just the common laborer. Yeah, exactly. So she's apparently gone here. Her bedroom door was found open. The fair bird had taken her departure during the night. (laughs) The fair bird. The parents were greatly distressed and at first didn't know what to make of the matter. But a letter written in Italian and found in Miss Hopkins' drawer and which was translated by a Spanish resident explained all. So apparently the Spanish resident could read Italian because the letter was written in Italian. But the parents... Couldn't read Italian? Well, this is Rose Hopkins' parents. And Rose could speak Italian, but I bet her parents couldn't. Oh, okay. So the two young people had been corresponding for some time, and it had been agreed upon to elope on Saturday night. It is believed that the couple have gone to Philadelphia. The angry father has sent telegrams in all directions to intercept the runaways. Miss Hopkins' action creates much comment. She is about 21 years old and had many admirers but was haughty and (laughs) high-minded. The Italian is of medium height with black eyes and black curly hair and a very pretty face. Miss Hopkins was always dressed in the height of fashion, but when she left her father's house, she had little little or no money in her possession. (laughs) Huh. So. That's funny. It's funny, too, that you say, and black eyes. And black eyes, I know. (laughs) And so I did find a couple of articles that basically said the same thing. However, they actually offered the Italian man's name, but they were both different, completely different names. So one name in an article said that his name was Tony Bush. (laughs) And one said... Antonette Beleshi. So, I mean. So that turned into Bush. I guess so. I and could then see that. Anto- Tony. Beleshi. So, but Just put Bush. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we, we don't know how to say that. Just put Bush. <laughs> and so, but these names, they didn't help me with researching the couple either. So. So they never found them. Uh, not that I could find. Um, and I, I looked her up on Ancestry as well, because I feel like her name was probably a little bit more solid as far as researching, because, you know, they, you know it's all these different names for him and I couldn't find anything on her I couldn't find anything on her dad or like if she married in the future so so he didn't just marry her for her money then no because she took off without anything yeah and she wasn't on a trust fund (laughs) right maybe they took off to Italy maybe they went back to Italy who knows (laughs) I have no idea but um I still thought it was kind of a kind of a cute little story you know right uh they fall in love and her dad is having a heart attack over it (laughs) But regardless, these two lovebirds were from very different worlds, and hopefully they found happiness. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a good ending. <laughs> yeah. And so the next story, this this story is just crazy. Um, and this is actually from the Patriot News as well in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it's dated February 18th, 1909. And we're just going to jump right into this headline and then read the article. So this headline reads, shot 250 feet through the sewer, lassoed to safety. <laughs> what? I got to process that a little yes. bit. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me actually read it one more time because I had to do the same thing. Shot 250 feet through the sewer, lassoed to safety. That's wow. the headline. How crazy is that? Still doesn't make a lot of no. sense to me. <laughs> well, so that's like the big main headline. And then it has the sub headline under it. And it says, unusual experience of Italian worker who fell into an open manhole. Oh, so, so he dropped. He dropped. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I am going to read this article because I can't sum it up in my own words. <laughs> okay. And so this actually, so this was reported in the Patriot News in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, but it actually took place in New York. Oh, okay. So falling into a rapidly flowing sewer after a tumble down an open manhole and later shooting through a narrow pipe for a distance of 250 oh. feet to be finally fished out of the East River at the end of a <laughs> cleverly thrown lasso. <laughs> Oh, so I get it. It drops down and yes. then the flow of the sewer 
yeah. gushed them out. It's Gush. like going down a, one of those slides. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not the kind of lazy river you want to spend a day on. <laughs> so yeah, so he drops down and then he shoots, shoots 250 through. feet and um, somebody gets him with a lasso. And so it goes on to say, this was the unusual experience today of Rocco Tersoni, an Italian worker engaged in repairing a bulkhead at 110th Street and the East River. Tersoni, in some unexplained manner, tumbled into a sewer manhole some 250 feet from the water's edge, and before aid could reach him, he had been forced into the three-foot sewer and swept out of sight of his companions. The flow of the sewer at this point is quite strong, and Tersoni was carried along and shot through the narrow aperture into the river. Here, however, Richard F. Ryan, a dock employee, was waiting for him with an improvised lasso. And when the body of Tersoni face down, oh gosh, mm. came rushing down out of the mouth of the sewer, it was neatly caught by a well-directed throw of the rope and quickly hauled to the pier and above. The Italian was unconscious when rescued, but artificial respiration Mm-mm. soon brought him back to life. So somebody wow. did CPR and brought him back to life. But they wish they had those mouth covers we have nowadays. <laughs> I'm glad that he was okay, I but I wasn't gonna oh, go anywhere man. with that. <laughs> Poor guy. And I'm well, glad he was for okay. The people. Yeah. To still do CPR. Right. I mean, because this is 1909. Um, so he was covered with sewage. Oh, I know. Like, way to go for the person right. who gave him CPR. Whew. It's humanity. Uh, exactly. <laughs> At its best, right there. And that was all I could find on Rocco Torsoni. So that's a good one. It's, <laughs> I know. It's funny, and I'm glad the guy was okay. But... It's funny with a happy ending. Okay, so our last story for Tales from the Archives is about a 12 year old boy, Joseph Fiore, who lived in Detroit, Michigan. And before we get to the main event of this story that act, that takes place in 1928, we're going to back up and do a little you know, just tell a little bit of the history of the family, because I was able to research this a little bit, but not enough to turn into a full episode. So on February 11th, 1918, Salvatore Fiore, who went by Sam and Salvatore is Joseph's father. He married his second wife, Virginia. And Sam, he had a son from his previous marriage, which was Joseph. And Joseph was born in 1915. So when Sam and Virginia married, Joseph was only three years old. And he lived with Sam and Virginia his whole life. So he actually considered Virginia his mother. He considered her his mother because when they married, he was only three years old. So um, Joseph's father, his name was Sam again. He was not a very loving slash caring person, especially when it came to Virginia, though. They had a lot of a lot of trouble in their marriage. Uh Uh-oh. And so... That's kind of the history of the family. And so now we're going to fast forward 10 years to May 28th, 1928, when Joseph is 12 years old. And so Sam, he owned a trucking company or so he either owned a trucking company or he worked as a contractor for the city driving trucks. I kind of saw both listed in newspaper articles. So he did something with vehicles and trucks, basically. And so, but regardless, on May 28th, Sam called home and asked Virginia to change the tire on one of their vehicles. And I'm thinking that this was a work vehicle he needed some work done on while he was out. So he called her and was like, hey, I need this tire changed on this vehicle. I'll be home in a little bit to get it. And so Virginia went out there and changed the tire. Wow. (laughs) I know, that's pretty good. But when Sam got home, he noticed that Virginia changed the tire on the wrong car. Uh-oh. So, um, and just a warning, this next part, it briefly mentions, you know, some domestic violence and not super graphic, but so this sent Sam into a rage and the couple, they started arguing. He was upset because she changed the tire on the wrong car. Um, and after a while with the arguing, Sam hit his limit and he took off his belt and he went after Virginia. Oh, gosh. I know. Um, and he started beating her with the belt. And after he was done, he stormed out of the house. And what year are we at? 1928. And so once Sam was gone, Joseph comforted his, comforted his mother and helped her out. And this had happened before in their home. So he had, you know, Joseph had seen this type of violence before, but this time he was fed up. He was done. And after he helped out his mom, he went and he found his father's revolver and waited on the front step for his father to come home. 
Uh-oh. Yeah. So when Sam returned home, Joseph walked towards his father and fired the gun once, and he struck his father in the back on the right side. Now, this is a little confusing because he got him in the back. Right. And so I don't know if the dad was turning around and getting something out of the car and Joseph shot at him. However, I also saw in another article, and this is where these old articles get really confusing. So when after Sam got done beating Virginia, uh, Joseph immediately went and got the gun and followed his father out and shot his dad as he was getting in his car to leave. So oh, that would make sense in the back. That kind of makes a little bit more sense, right? So there's those two differing stories on how Sam died. But regardless, after Joseph shot his father, whether it was when he was leaving or returning, Joseph fled and immediately went to his grandparents' house. And so the neighbors, they heard the gunshots and they saw Sam lying on the ground. So they they were the ones that called the police. By the time the police and ambulance got there, Sam had already passed away. So while Joseph was at his grandparents' house, he started getting worried about his mom. And so he called home to check on her. Well, the police were at the house looking for Joseph because they knew that he was the one that shot Sam, his dad. And so they got on the phone with him and Joseph told him where he was, that he was at his grandparents' house. They went and picked him up and took him to the station for questioning. So once at the station, Joseph told investigators that he, quote, did it because he was whipping my mother. I wanted to teach him a lesson so he wouldn't do it again. I did not want my mother to suffer. So that kind of that quote right there kind of tells me that he had probably seen this numerous times. Oh, I'm sure. How terrible. Yeah, because he probably had such a temper anyway. And, mm-hmm. you know, so it, it could have been daily. Exactly. And then as Joseph starts getting older, you know, he starts wanting to protect his mom more. But it's just that that quote kind of tells a lot. And so the investigators, they also asked Joseph if he meant to kill his father. And Joseph responded by saying, I don't know whether it was murder or not, sir. I have never shot a pistol before, and I didn't intend to kill him, but I had to do something desperate to stop this whipping of my mother. And that just... That's honest. It's honest, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And it kind of shows his age, like, I don't know whether it was murder or not, you know? Right. And he just knew a gun was going to be a threat. A threat, and would help maybe stop his father from doing it in the future. So, and this, this part... (laughs) I just said that that quote tells his age, but this part actually really shows, you know, he's 12 years old, shows how young he is. So after the investigators were questioning him, Joseph became really upset and he started crying. And one of the police officers comforted Joseph and had him sit in his lap. And then Joseph fell asleep in the police officer's lap. Oh, I know. It's just like. That's sad. It is. It shows how young he truly is. How innocent it was. Exactly. He was just trying to do a thing, the good thing to buy to protect his mom. So, ugh, poor kid. Um, but while he was sleeping, the police <laughs> brought in Virginia and questioned her, and she completely corroborated his story. And in fact, the neighbors even corroborated his story by saying Sam often abused yeah. Virginia. That's good. Yeah. Well, and the authorities they released Virginia, but they actually placed Joseph in a juvenile detention center. And this poor little guy. I mean, just thinking about him a few moments ago sleeping and hit the police officer's arm and now he has to go to a detention center he was probably terrified yeah that he would never see his mom again exactly and like what is his future going to be and you know it's just a horrible situation but as far as the case goes i couldn't find anything on it you know this happened in may and then i found an article in july where he was waiting to go to trial but i i couldn't find anything on oh the trial or nothing so I'm assuming the tri- the charges were dropped because this was such a big story. Oh, it was in the trial would have been yes, written about exactly because this was in newspapers across the country. Oh, okay. And it was like yeah, after, I bet you're right. Yep, after July, it was nothing. And hopefully, he got to go back home. And I think he did because he was in the army, served in World War II. He went on to get married and had a couple of children. So I think. The charges were dropped because, like you said, the trial would have been in the newspapers. Right. This was yeah, a huge a 12 story. 12-year-old boy. On trial for murder mm-hmm. for his father. That would have been everywhere. Right. And like I said, after July of 1928, there is nothing in the newspapers about this incident. So, yeah. And like I said, I couldn't really find anything anything after that other than a little bit of information on ancestry. He served in World War II. He was married. They had two children. 
And he passed away at the age of 86 in Michigan. So oh, well, he went on to live a, a long he got life. Through it. He got through it. Exactly. So, it, and I even looked up Virginia and she, she remarried later on and still lived in Michigan. So hopefully they found some peace and were able right. to move on. Well, good for him. I mean, you know, justice was served. So. Exactly. Yep. And, you know, he was so young and just trying to protect his mom. So, but that was our last story of Tales of the Archives. That was a fun episode. It was. It was kind of. Those it, were very interesting. They were. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the thing is I just, I don't want these these articles to go untold right you know because yeah. there's still a story there they're just mini stories and so i think what we'll do is like i said earlier we'll have these maybe once twice a month um where we just kind of bring these small little mini stories back to life and right tell what we know about them yeah they're interesting they're they're fun <laughs> they are they're fun yeah i mean it's just there, and I have a whole bunch of them, so I I hope <laughs> yeah. you guys liked the tells of the archive because, like Mom said, we've got a bunch of them. So yes, yes she does. <laughs> yep. Well, uh, we hope you enjoyed listening to our first tells of the archives episode, and we hope you come back to listen to more stories about Italian Americans. See you next time. See you next time. <laughs>